Welcome to the 2016 Outlook webinar hosted by Valen Analytics. I'm Kirsten Marr, VP of Marketing for Valen. We'll begin by introducing our featured speaker. Brett Schroyer is an actuary and solutions architect for Valen Analytics. He identifies practical solutions for client success, identifying opportunities to bring tangible benefits from technical modeling. Brett uses his insurance industry and technical modeling expertise to bridge the gap that sometimes exists between statistical modelers and PNC actuaries and underwriting managers. Brett joined Valen in 2014, bringing a breadth and depth of professional experience in actuarial analysis and financial modeling earned over his 20-year career as a PNC actuary and insurance professional. Prior to joining Valen, Brett served as Senior Vice President of Reinsurance for Willis Re in Minneapolis. He led their predictive modeling practice and performed quantitative analysis and actuarial modeling in support of property and casualty reinsurance placements. Prior to this, Brett served in a variety of PNC insurance management roles, including actuarial and underwriting director positions at Travelers and as an actuarial consultant with Deloitte. With that, Brett, I'll turn it over to you to begin. Okay, thanks, Kirsten. We're here today to talk about the insurance industry and the fact that we believe that it's at a crossroads. Uh, this is a fundamental shift that's occurring right now. It's challenging the conventional wisdom that's built up over the last 100 years in insurance company management, insurance industry management. That belief is that to succeed in insurance, you can simply count on solid underwriting, actuarially sound pricing and reserving and effective claims management. The fundamental shift is that this conventional wisdom is being challenged by a new reality that all companies are turning into technology companies. Take uh, rip from the headlines recently, take John Deere, uh, which you may think of as a farm equipment manufacturer, but they think of themselves as a software company and a software licensing company. They're currently in court with farmers who thought that they have bought a tractor, but John Deere asserts that they're actually licensing the ability to operate that vehicle controlled by their computer software. Take Airbnb. They're now one of the largest hotel chains in the world, and yet they own no properties. Or Facebook, an online media giant that actually publishes no content. All of this has spawned an, an entirely new category of business um, that is now known as the one-tap economy. It's catering to the needs of a consumer who's looking for a solution at the touch of a button. Uber has over one million active drivers. It's the fastest growing startup in history. It's valued at $51 billion. It's become the go-to company for a local passenger service. It's even here at Valence, our preferred provider for business travel needs. Uber owns no vehicles. Disruptive technologies can gain extremely rapid adoption in this current environment. Consider what the taxi industry looked like just five years ago. They thought they had regulatory protection, a captive market, a high barrier to entry. And Uber turned all of that on its ear. Does that sound familiar? It's just like what the insurance industry believes that it has right now. Regulatory protection, a captive market that needs to buy the product, agents that own the renewals, and a high barrier to entry. So we're going to be looking at some of these themes uh, and, and exploring what is up with the new economy and what we as an industry need to do to adapt and to innovate. Here's a disruptor that's a little closer to insurance, a company that uh, many of you may have never heard of, but I have a feeling that you will soon. The company is called Zenefits. Zenefits offers its clients free, truly free, cloud-based HR management software. They do payroll where they allow companies to do payroll, onboarding, benefits, vacation tracking, you get the picture. And all of this is free for everyone, any company of any size. They also offer their clients the option to purchase insurance through that same platform. So Zenefits is the agent of record, and it earns a commission on insurance purchase in this way. They launched in May of 2013 and had revenue of about a million dollars in their first year. One year later, 2014, they saw $20 million in revenue. 2015 stats aren't out yet, but it's looking like it's going to be over $100 million in revenue. So in just two years, the company has grown to 1,400 employees and a $5 billion valuation. Their revenue 
is as an insurance agency, but they see and run themselves as a software company. So what's up with the PNC insurance industry? We're not seen as a hotbed of innovation. We've been doing the same thing with the same tools for nearly 100 years. Some would argue that our industry only chooses innovation when we really exhausted all of the other viable options. And this isn't a big secret. Survey results recently released by KPMG paints a pretty clear picture. Insurance professionals are realizing that innovation is one of the keys to success. But at the same time, they feel that they don't have the skills that they need to lead in that innovation. We've all been in the industry for a long time, and we've seen over the last several decades the industry has been slow to innovate. The world is changing around us. Why am I so focused on innovation here? It's because if we continue to do business as we always have, I fear that we as an industry, the traditional insurance industry, are, are risking irrelevance. Like I said, the insurance industry is at a crossroads. It's getting low scores from consumers. Look at the comments on these two Google customer surveys. A ComScore report on the online auto insurance experience shows that most customers believe they could save money if they had an easy way to compare prices. They don't trust the carriers anymore. It's vital in today's information economy to meet your consumer's demand. If you don't, they will find a way around you. Your competitors will help them do that. What happens when your customers aren't happy? Competitors come in. They see the opportunity and they pounce. They try to give the customer what they really want, and this is what's driving the new economy. It's the data that's driving these realizations and giving the incomers, the competitors, a chance to disrupt what we thought as a stable uh, environment of p and insurance. It's a very common pattern among companies that are winning in the market share game. First, it acts as a catalyst and drives the founders to look at the market differently than the established competition. Next, data and information give them some unique knowledge about their customers and the market that others, quite frankly, didn't pick up on early enough. And finally, being analytically driven facilitates a breakthrough innovation that allows them to succeed in gaining a dominant market position. Have you ever wondered how Netflix was born? The catalyst was a $40 late fee. Reed Hastings, the, the founder of Netflix, was fed up with Blockbuster. He'd received a $40 late fee and decided that there had to be a better way. So he founded a company based upon data and analytics. They used data on the viewing habits of their customers to figure out what their customers were watching and when and why. The breakthrough was predicting what they would like to watch next. They were feeding this watching behavior, they were driving the watching behavior, which created stickiness and expanded their platform. Netflix, however, did experience an innovator's dilemma. How do you keep growing once you've, uh, once you've tapped your, your target market? They strategized some original content uh, would probably drive more people to their platform. They'd come up with some original content, but what to produce? So they looked at their own data, and they found that politics, Kevin Spacey and the director David Fincher were all hot with their viewers. So they worked backwards from the data. They built a show that incorporated these three elements. House of Cards was born. The show wasn't somebody's artistic dream. It was pure marketing analytics. It was creation of a product to meet what they already knew was market demand. Capital was another closer to insurance sort of innovation story. Nigel Morris and Richard Fairbank, the co-founders of Capital One, saw a big gap in the credit card market. There was an untapped market of people who didn't qualify for traditional card products, what was called then the subprime market. They couldn't get cards. So they used predictive analytics to target the profitable good risks within this segment and to offer them cards. They coined the term information-based strategy, which led to them becoming a top five global consumer credit card company in just a few years. Finally, Progressive, this was firmly in the realm of insurance, we all know the Progressive story. They saw that there was an underserved market in, in non-standard auto, they used predictive analytics to understand their customers better than their competitors, and they created positive selection uh, for them and adverse selection for their competitors who were quoting a lower price than what Progressive 
determined were the worst performing risks. In fact, Progressive actually encouraged this adverse selection by showing high-risk applicants where to find those underpriced policies. They were driving adverse selection to their competition. Progressive led the way in personal insurance, but it didn't stop there. Its top 10 personal auto riders are now riding nearly three quarters of the market and are doing so at a combined ratio in the low 90s. This is a consolidation of personal auto that's being driven by data and analytics. Those that have the data and analytics are profitable, they're growing, and they're consolidating market share. Those that didn't adapt to the change were the losers. They're the ones who are driving this consolidation, or the ones that were victims of this consolidation. The same thing is happening right now in commercial lines, but it's just starting. There have been some notable shifts, however. We expect to see the same consolidation in commercial lines take place over the next 10 years as more carriers make use of information-based strategy. From a recent Fitch analysis, we looked at 2009 to 2014, um, the companies that were shrinking the most in premium were doing so because of poor underwriting results. And the companies that were growing the most in premium were seeing superior underwriting results. Look at the list here, top-ranked travelers had an average annual increase over the five-year period of almost 10% a year. Hartford at a 5% growth rate. Berkshire, starting from next to nothing, is now in fifth place, having an annual average premium growth of nearly 40%. What are these companies doing differently that's allowing them to outperform and grab market share? They're not going into the market and growing through undercutting the competition. They know better what they're insuring, and they're able to target profitable business, stealing it away from established carriers. Successful carriers realize the importance of knowing what they insure. It's just that simple. They know that no portfolio or class or territory is truly homogenous. There are good risks in bad segments. There are bad risks in good segments. What you're looking at right now is called a lift chart. Uh, I'm going to take a moment and, and dissect this a bit and, and talk about what this is. Uh, this is a standard tool in predictive analytics to investigate the power and the accuracy of a predictive model. So imagine that this uh, is a carrier, and this is taken from a live example. So this is a carrier that has, let's say, $200 million in, in premium in this portfolio. Each policy is given a score from 1 to 10, with 1 being the best, 10 being the worst. Uh, the score coming out of the model it says, uh, or it gives a prediction of what the loss ratio will be on that given policy. So all of the policies that are predicted to have the best loss ratio, the lowest loss ratio, are going to be given a score of 1. All the policies that are predicted to have a higher than average loss ratio, or the highest loss ratio, are given a score of 10. After we put all of those policies into the various buckets, now we measure how many policies went into each bucket. So for this carrier, quite a few of the policies were given a score of 1. This carrier had an underwriting preference to be writing a lot of loss-free, small, Main Street sort of policies, and those are predicted to be very good. In fact, those the market understands that, and the market gives them a very low price. They also, though, had some policies that were over here in the, in the bin 10 that were predicted to be at a high loss ratio. So we see in the bars, we see the total volume of premium at each score level. Now we're going to look at the dotted line in this graph. That's the predicted loss ratio within each bucket. Bin, bin 1 here is at about a 70%, 70% of average. Bin 5 and 6 are at about a 1.0, so that's 100% of average. So stuff in 5 and 6 is average policies. Over here in 10, way up here at about 1.7, or 70% worse than average on a predicted basis, it's the bottom line. When we've done that, we can now go back three years later, two years later, and measure the solid line. What is the actual loss ratio that's emerging in these policies? What we hope to see is that the actual line and the predicted line are fairly close, and in this case, they are. The other thing that we hope to see is that there's a huge difference between this point up here at about 1.7, and this point down here at about 0 0.7, 
That's referred to as the lift. So it's from from 0.7 to 1.7, or about 100 points of available lift on a loss ratio relativity basis. So successful carriers are seeing that if they have the ability to differentiate like this, where they can say there's a segment of the portfolio that's significantly worse than average and a segment that's significantly better than average, they can accomplish quite a bit in driving profit from that. We wanted to estimate what this knowledge would be worth. What kind of profit could you drive from this if you had these statistics available to you? So we looked at a longitudinal study across uh, multiple carriers, waiting for my slide to catch up, um, and we plotted out how much of their profitability was present, how much of their portfolio profit was present at each one of these score levels. So imagine we, we've got we've got 10 bins again across this uh, axis here. So all of these dots over here in between 0 and 1 represent the first bin. And we're saying how much of the portfolio profit is in the first bin? And the answer was about 50% of the portfolio profit was actually achieved from that first bin. The worst 10% of the portfolio, if it could be eliminated, would result in about a 60% overall portfolio profit increase. And then finally, we said, what amount of their portfolio would carrier have to write to maximize their profit? And that's about the 75th percentile. So if they, if they could eliminate somehow about 25% of the policies, they would roughly double the profit in their book. Now, this study was across multiple carriers, across multiple lines of business, workers' compensation, a business owner's um, package uh, program, commercial auto, uh, and we, we simply took all of these data points and roughly fit a curve to it. I know that this is very non-scientific and not technical, but we're looking for the shape of this thing and to see on average uh, on a broad spectrum what could we expect to see. A couple of important points here. Um, the x-axis here is a predicted score. This is not based upon actual losses that we know about. This is what we know at the time that we're underwriting a policy. Would we, put the, would we put those policies way over here at the best end of the spectrum or at the worst end of the spectrum? The y-axis, however, is actual. This is what was measured two or three years later once losses had begun to emerge and we had a clear picture of what the actual profitability was. This is a, a good benchmark for a company to say, if they have a model, to, to look at uh, where their model stacks up against this industry curve and see how how much predictive power they have in their model, how much available profit that they have if they were to implement it, and maybe it helps point them to a strategy, how they'd want to implement the model uh, if they were planning on growing the book, shrinking the book, or just plain optimizing the book. There's an interesting cost that's associated with not knowing what you insure as well. This was revealed to me a couple years ago when I was reviewing a market cycle study that's put out every year by Willis Ree. There's no surprise that accident year results in workers' compensation are very cyclical. There's a definite hard and soft market cycle. The blue line here is that cycle. It's the accident year loss ratio over the years. What is a bit surprising, though, is that when we took a look at the second line, the green line, this is pure loss cost. That's dollars of loss divided by dollars of payroll. What we saw here is that loss costs have been relatively flat since the mid-90s. Why are we experiencing cycles in loss ratio if the loss costs have been relatively flat for two decades? The answer is that the market is bringing these cycles upon itself. They're not related to the underlying risk. They're related to price. The red line here is price. As prices go up, prices go down, the profits ebb and flow at the same time. What happens when carriers and what they insure is that they can elect to remove themselves from this market cycle. They can take on less premium when prices are soft. They can enter more aggressively when prices are hard because they can identify the good risks from the bad. They can choose to play or not play while the rest of the market is toying with the prices. It should become a little bit more clear now why we call this innovation crossroads 
for insurance. Carriers need to be making an underwriting profit now because investment income is just not there. Leverage is down on the entire industry, and the industry is bearing the weight of the surplus capital. We have to be making an underwriting income. We can't rely on investment income. There's a consolidation simultaneously in the market to carry this with better analytics. We saw this in personal lines, and we saw this starting in commercial lines. And there's the threat from non-traditional upstart markets that are about analytics first and insurance second. It's a triple threat on the status quo to insurance. We can't continue doing things the way that we always have. This insurance innovation is already here. Companies in the insurance tech space have raised over $2 billion since 2010, and a whopping $1.4 billion of that has come since 2014. 2015 is now the biggest year on record, uh, and investor interest in the insurance tech space is up 10 times over the last five years. A recent KPMG survey tells us that this competitive pressure is very real, and it's just going to keep ramping up. So the choice for us is clear. We have to innovate or face obsolescence. Why, I ask this question, why are we so bad as an industry at innovating? What is standing in our way? If it turns out, I think, we are our own worst enemies. Valen performed a survey in 2015 that revealed a pervasive conflict between actuaries and underwriters that we believe is standing in the way of innovation. We surveyed actuaries, underwriters, executive, marketing, claims, agents, a wide cross-spectrum of insurance professionals. Survey respondents said overwhelmingly that actuaries and underwriters are frequently at odds over price. What's really insightful were the results when we asked why are they at odds over price. By a wide margin, the most popular opinion was that underwriters simply don't trust in the data. They prefer instead to rely primarily on their judgment. We have some fascinating stats on this that we'll share in a couple of slides. But first, we'll jump to another survey that Mallon conducted in 2015 where we asked the question, why don't underwriters trust the data? This is a bit of a prescient survey. It was actually performed before the survey on the previous slide. Um, so why don't underwriters trust the data? The top two responses from underwriters were that, one, they're worried about their jobs, and two, they just simply don't understand predictive analytics. If you're an underwriter, or if you manage a group of underwriters, this probably resonates with you. You've probably heard this as well. And this is one of our biggest challenges as a vendor in the space, as a thought leader in the space, is coaching our clients through the organizational changes that they need to be making to implement predictive analytics. We need to get everybody within the organization to see the importance of the underwriter and the model and how they can work together. The case study I'm going to share next is a great response to that, uh, that, that idea that the underwriter fears that the model will take their job. It, it illustrates that it's not about competition between the underwriter and the model. It's about an integration of the model into um, underwriter decision making at the desk level. So we performed a study for one of our clients where we started by analyzing the pricing accuracy, that is the lift, of their current underwriting process. Turns out the company was okay at underwriting or at identifying good risk versus bad risk. We assumed um, that when an underwriter gave a credit to a risk, they were saying this is a good risk. When they gave a debit, they were saying this is a bad risk. Um, and so we actually were able to graph that out. And I'm gonna I'm just gonna highlight it here. So this this represents the lift from the underwriters. The underwriters, absent the model, were able to identify policies that at this end were 25% better than average. And on the worst end, about 50% worse than average. So a 75 percentile point difference, 75 points of lift. Next, we looked at a predictive model. Oops, and I'm drawing on the slide again. Go back to that. Next, we looked at a predictive model and found that the lift we're able to generate here went from about 50% better than average to about 75% worse than average. This is about 125 points of lift, so that's that's better, but that's not the end of the story. What really surprised us is what happened when we combined 
those two models, the underwriter and the predictive model. For every policy, we took the underwriting score from 1 to 10. We took the model score from 1 to 10. We took the simple average to determine a combined score. This would leverage both the model sophistication and the underwriter's expertise, and it resulted in, a, in an ensemble model that was better than either taken individually. Separated the good risks at 75% better than average from the bad risks at 100% worse than average for a total of 175 points of lift. The key takeaway here is that the model is not here to displace the underwriter. We can't afford to ignore underwriting expertise. Instead, we need to find a way to combine the art of the underwriter with the science of the model to attain results that you can't achieve with either taken alone. Let's go back to the survey for a moment. Aside from those who say that they don't trust the data, there's the other half of the respondents who said that actuaries and underwriters were at odds because fundamentally actuaries are too conservative or underwriters are too aggressive. I guess your opinion here probably depends on which side of the fence you're on in your career. Regardless, that's three quarters of the responses indicating a deep-rooted conflict between actuaries and underwriters. But what about the quarter that didn't identify conflict? Is this quarter who don't think there was a conflict better equipped to make innovative leaps and win in the market? We believe that they are. We also think that every carrier has the ability to turn this around and join the innovation. It's not too late to make a move into predictive analytics. Among small and mid-sized carriers that we surveyed, we found that half of the carriers using predictive analytics have been doing so for two years or less, and half of those not already using predictive analytics intend to start within the next 12 months. So we are still in the first waves of predictive analytics adoption, particularly in commercial lines. At Valen, we see companies go through distinct phases in their journey toward implementing predictive analytics. Everybody starts in phase zero. Phase zero is where we're just simply not using predictive analytics at all. We might be aware of it, it might be in a future roadmap, but we're not using it. Carriers move to phase one when they start their first project. These are typically low-hanging fruit, they're easy wins, we call them beachhead projects because uh, it's an easily identifiable target and there's a lot to gain for a very small investment in, in time and effort. It might be, um, it, it's typically a, an underwriting model. It could be risk selection, it could be pricing, it could be intending to grow a book of business or to fix a loss ratio issue. Phase two happens when a carrier expands upon the early wins that they've seen in phase one. They are emboldened by their progress, and they're emboldened by the results, and they find more ways uh, to impl implement predictive analytics within the company. There's organizational support from actuarial, from underwriting, from executive. Uh, these, these might happen in claims, might happen in auditing, might happen in market, but you're expanding to other areas in the company. Phase three is maturity. This is where predictive analytics is used throughout the organization and is and in phase three, we're now focusing on optimization. We want to make our models better. We want to make them work better together. We want to find more sources of data to expand the power of our models. Believe it or not, if the, if the move from zero to one that we think is the most impactful for a company. What can happen at phase one? Turns out quite a lot. We looked at the class, uh, the phase one class of 2012. These are workers' compensation carriers that implemented their first model in 2012. We measured the change in their accident year loss ratios over the next years, over the next two years compared to the entire work comp industry. What we found is that over this period, 2011 to 2014, we had good results for the work comp industry as a whole. That's the orange line here. Loss ratios improved for the industry nearly 10 points over this period. The newly minted phase one companies saw more than twice that. They said 24 points of loss ratio improvement. We certainly can't attribute every single bit of the success that these companies had to following a predictive model. We certainly hope that quite a bit of it was due to that. Uh, but we find that companies fundamentally change the way that they manage their business when they start using predictive analytics. 
when they move from phase zero to phase one, it's not just that they're implementing a single tool. They're implementing a change in the way that they manage data. They're becoming a, 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 they're becoming a data managed company. They're using data driven decision making uh, to target their processes, to target their monitoring, to target their strategy development. They join the ranks of information based strategy firms. This is the new economy. They've learned that data isn't a replacement for underwriting. And in fact, they've learned that data offers the underwriter a chance to sharpen their impact on their portfolio. They've learned that they can lead the market, not simply follow it. They've learned how to aggressively employ adverse selection rather than simply trying to defend against it when it appears. And they've learned that the market will be driven by those who can best make use of the available data. Using data, using data-driven decision-making, they're bringing together their actuarial, underwriting, executive, and claims functions and are able to compete in the new economy. Kirsten, do we have any questions that have come out or comments? Yeah, we do. Thank you, Brett. Um, so right now we have a few questions that are coming in. I'm going to pause just for a, a brief moment. So if you uh, listening have any questions that you'd like to ask, you have just a second to uh, uh, type them in. So we'll just pause here for about 60 seconds and we'll get started with uh, questions. Okay, um, I have a couple people asking if um, the slides will be available for download. Yes, we will send out a link to the recording uh, tomorrow. Uh, Brett, first question I'm actually going to start answering and then you can, you can uh, add on. Uh, when referencing the market share chart, how much of that increase is due to mergers and acquisitions, uh, top 10 companies purchasing smaller companies? So that, that Fitch survey, um, is focused on market share, so companies who chose to either grow aggressively uh, in workers' compensation or retract based on underwriting performance. It is true that in 2015 there was a lot of merger and acquisition activity. In fact, it was up over 60%, uh, but this study in particular has to do more with companies getting aggressive in the market versus uh, mergers and acquisitions. Brett, is there anything you want to add to my answer there? Yeah, I, I think that I'd, I'd like to challenge, um, I know this is bad form for a presenter, but I'd like to challenge the question um, and challenge the mindset behind it that in a way it, it doesn't matter if it's organic growth or if it's acquisition. You know, either way, you're, you're losing your portfolio to you know, somebody who is doing a better job of managing it and underwriting it. Um, and I think that there's quite a bit of acquisition that happens in the market right now as carriers become stronger, have capital, you know, have a, have a plan to grow and an ability to execute. Um, that's a completely viable strategy and, and the driving forces are exactly the same behind either. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so here's the next question, Brett. Really liked the illustration of an ensemble model between underwriting and predictive. However, when you do a simple average between the two, would have expected the ensemble to come in between the two lines, not more steeper, i.e. better. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you could expect that. I, I don't know that that is a, uh, to, to be honest, no, I wouldn't expect that. Um, what you're going to see is that your your risks are going to be shifting in ways. So, to the extent that you have um, to the extent that you have disagreement between the models, you're going to you're going to bring some um, you're going to bring some of the tails in towards the middle. To the extent that you have agreement between the models, you're going to have reinforcing at the tips and tails. So the things that the model thinks are bad and the underwriter thinks are bad are going to stay out there in bin 10. 
But if the model thinks it's bad and the underwriter thinks it's good, it could be moving it back from 10, say, back to 8. Um, and it turns out that was correct. It wasn't a 10. Uh, it, was, it was closer to something um, further to the left, further toward the mean. It, it, it's an interesting intellectual question. I guess we'd have, we'd have to expand this to look at a bunch of other portfolios uh, and see if this result holds over, over multiple portfolios. Great. We have a couple more questions on this particular um, piece of it. Um, so you suggested on, ensembling a model and underwriter input, but why not just ensemble a variety of models and leave the underwriters out of it? Uh, um, I, I, don't, I don't think that that would um, capture the, the spirit of what we're trying to capture here. Uh, it is possible to build more and more increasingly complex and powerful models, but there are still going to be things that the underwriter and only the underwriter is able to capture, particularly with complex risks in commercial lines. Uh, I'm not saying that the model that we employed here, the red line in this graph, is the most powerful model uh, available or, or even the best model available. We, we deliberately choose, um, for, chose for this implementation, we chose a model that was very transparent to the underwriter, was very intuitive to the underwriter, so they under, understand how it worked. Um, at the expense of something that would be a black box. You know, this isn't a neural network. It isn't a support vector machine. It's, it's something that the underwriter can look at it, understand the inputs and why it works. But along the way, you, you know that you have a limited number of very quantifiable inputs, and the underwriter knows that they have access to a whole bunch of non-quantifiable, subjective stuff that's not in the model. So the underwriter knows what the model knows, and the underwriter knows what the model knows. Put those two together, and we find you have a superlative result. We have one more question on this uh, piece of it, Brett. Um, on the art plus science graph, how are the risk score bins generated by the model or by the underwriter? The it's a good question. So the the underwriter score. Um, the definition of the of the bins. This is a good question. Okay, when we when we looked at the underwriter score, we we defined the bins as being, um, if you recall, when the underwriter gave a credit, it was going to get a, a lower score. When the underwriter gave a debit, it was going to be a higher score. So bin five right here would be a credit of up to five percent. Bin four is a credit of up to ten percent. You know, between five and ten. Bin three was, I think, up to fifteen or up to twenty percent credit, and so on. Um, that definition was the same for the underwriter and the model. Now, when you take an ensemble model, take the average of the two, that definition no longer makes any sense because the the ensemble model isn't necessarily telling you what the predicted credit is. It's just taking a simple average of those two scores. Um, you you could probably look at that ensemble model and whether you could optimize it uh, by taking different bin cuts or bin definitions, um, but we didn't do that. We, we literally took the simplest, least assumption-ridden exercise we could, take the simple average of those two scores, uh, and, then, and then draw out the result on the, on the final ensemble score. Um, so to move on to a different piece of the presentation, what analysis was done with respect to the last 10% block? This is on the profitability. Um, where does it sit in your book? So what analysis was done with respect to the last 10% of the block, and what percent is connected to the rest of the block versus mutually exclusive policies? Does that question make sense? Uh, it, it might. I can, go into, I can go into that a little bit more. I wanted to bring up the slide. There it is. Oops. The so it, it it takes a little bit of thought, you know, to, to, to get there. But imagine if you wrote if you wrote everything. Um, oh, there's another important. Maybe I left this out. The from left to right, this is kind of a it's a cumulative sort of measure. So um, by the time we get over here, all the way over to ten, we've written everything. And so this line has to stop at 100. It has to come back to 100%. So that's by definition. If you write 100% of your portfolio, you get 100% of your profit. 
But if you only write 90% of your portfolio, that is, you're not going to write the, the worst 10% predicted, the 10% of your policies that are predicted to be the worst performing. If you only wrote 90% and you looked at the, the profitability in your portfolio, you would see a profitability increase of 60%. So these policies over here at the worst 10% are very unprofitable. Uh, and, and again, the, the, the profitability prediction is that. It's a prediction. It's the information that's available at the time of underwriting. We don't know what the actual loss ratio is on anything at that point. The, score, the policies are arranged on the x-axis by the predicted score. And then we're looking at their contribution to portfolio profit uh, as, as the y-axis. Hopefully, and, and if that didn't answer the question, maybe the, the submitter can, can um, clarify the question. Sure, yeah, we can still receive questions if, if that's the case. Um, next question, what size of insurers would benefit from predictive analytics? For example, would an insurer with gross written premium less than 200 million benefit with limited data? <laughs> um, well, our, frankly, our, our target market, the companies that we've been working with uh, primarily for the last five years that have been seeing the most value have been in the 50 to $200 million range within a line of business. And, and we're really dealing with one line of business at a time. It could be commercial audit, it could be bots, it could be work comp. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, and it's obviously a question of what the cost of the solution is, the benefit sort of equation. When you have the ability, as we saw in the, the class of, of 2012 slide, when you have the ability to see over a, over a two or three year span um, an additional five points or ten points of loss ratio benefit, it doesn't take, you know, it, 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 it doesn't take much um, to see in a huge result, a huge return on your investment um, when, you, when you've got a 5% improvement that's available to you. Now, the other side of the question is, if you are, let's say you are a $50 million carrier, you've got $50 million of commercial auto, and you want to build a model. You can't, you can't do that. There isn't enough data in your portfolio to build a model. You would need to either find a data source in the industry that you could latch onto and build a model, or find a partner that has access to that data and use a model that's based upon some sort of consortium data. Um, Valen does this with work comp, with commercial auto, uh, with other lines of business coming in the future. Okay, great. Um, next question. Uh, tech companies are mainly engaged in the distribution discipline. Do you expect them to apply the same pricing and compensation pressure that the top 10 brokers have historically on carriers? If so, how will carriers handle the overall pricing risk selection? I missed the first word. What, what kind of companies? Tech. Tech companies. Oh, um, and I, I'm sorry. I, I was so hung up on listening to the first word that I didn't hear that I didn't hear the rest of it. Now. Okay, so let me repeat. Tech companies are mainly engaged in the distribution discipline. So that's where most of the disruption is happening, right, on the distribution side with agents. Do you expect okay. them to apply the same pricing and compensation pressure uh, that brokers have historically done on carriers? If so, how will carriers handle overall pricing and risk selection? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, 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 I don't... I don't yeah, here, ahead. Brett, why don't I... I'll, um, I'll kind of give my take and then you can, you can sort of weigh in. And I think the, it's a good question. No, there's no doubt that um, just like the Netflix and... Google and, and Capital One examples, when tech innovators come into a market, they first attack customer acquisition, which in insurance is dis right, distribution, uh, and, th and that's where they start. Um, but that has a wave effect on the entire industry. So as they put pricing pressure um, on distribution and give consumers what they're looking for, which is more transparency in price, um, an a easier uh, ability to compare coverages and prices, it puts a strain and a stress on the entire system. And so 
Um, carriers absolutely are going to have to look at their pricing and risk selection and say, hey, if competition is going to heat up, my ability to align price to risk and to do it much more quickly, you know, on-time, real-time quoting, and make sure I'm accurate and make sure I'm profitable on a per-policy basis, um, that, that is only going to heat up for the primary carrier. So uh, whether tech companies actually start to compete directly with primary carriers, that is really remains to be seen. Um, but the effect on how you price and select risk and still maintain profits, especially with uh, investment losses and the need to make up underwriting profit, it's just squeezing you from all sides. So that's how I would start to answer that question. Brett, I don't know what you want to add. Yeah, a couple things to add. I, I think that it's, it's dangerous to assume that the current distribution model will, will persist. Um, I, I know that commercial lines is still very much, you know, agent and, and broker driven, um, but it is moving toward a direct business. Um, it's starting at the fringes, it's starting at the small risks, but it'll become more and more um, direct marketed uh, as better analytics come on board and as, as these tech companies have a better insight into the risk quality and as the, as the insurers, as the risks themselves have better self-awareness of their risk quality, they are going to be more willing and able to go out and, and seek cover on a direct basis, which potentially disintermediates the agents completely. So that, that's another big change that I see potentially coming uh, to the market. So there's another question along these lines. Has Valen identified a difference in the analytics success between direct writers and independent agency companies that may have less control over the sales process? Are direct channel companies in a better position to harness the power of data? I don't know that we've actually seen that yet. It's a good question. No, it would be anecdotal. Um, just you know, We obviously talk to our clients about what their distribution channel looks like. Um, and sometimes carriers that have a traditional independent agency plant uh, have some challenges in communicating their move to predictive analytics with the agents. Um, but that's all it is. It's a, you know, it's a it's a strategy decision. It's an implementation you know communication plan. Uh, but it doesn't stand in the way for long. You know, you you can't you can't prevent this all from happening. Uh, and if you message it right, it's actually a very powerful thing with your independent agency plan. Um, so I don't see that there's a huge uh, bifurcate the market between between the independent agent, the captive agent, and the direct markets in their ability to use predictive analytics. Uh, so it looks like we have just one last question, Brett. Um, can you go into more detail about the stats you shared on how many small, mid-sized carriers are using no predictive analytics? Yeah, um, and, and I'm not going to bring up the slide, but I think it was about half are not. Uh, and, but, but of the half that, that are, that you know, they intend to start. Um, this match, is, you know, that stat came from a survey that we had done, um, I believe, Kirsten, right? That's right. Or was it? Okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that that's even accurate because I think that that was taken about a year ago, and I've noticed a big shift over the last year as we're talking with even small um, commercial lines carriers, you know, companies that have a, a twenty or thirty million dollar portfolio in, um, you know, in a, in a line of business and maybe fifty million dollars overall premium, they're all talking about it as well. So everybody is aware that it's coming, that it's that it's needed, that it's something that they want to do. It's now just a question of how can we find a way to do it. And let's start small. Let's be incremental. Find a way to put it in place. Learn and grow from there. Uh, it. it Certainly, anecdotally, the, of the clients that we're talking to that I call small commercial, they're about 50-50 that, that are using it uh, versus not using it. But the, the, the intent, I think, is, is nearing 100% of the companies know that it's something that has to be on their radar, radar uh, something that they have to be uh, looking at in the near future. Um, and then we just had a comment, not a question, um, not a question, but even Larger agents and brokers are moving small commercial to service centers where they will utilize those companies that make it easier to do business with. Thus, this disruption is occurring within traditional channels, let alone innovators, which I think is a very good point. Um, right. The point is it's just, it's in, a, it's in a lot of change. And to your point about, you know, we, a survey result that we had a year ago 
um, we're, we're going to continue to survey the industry every year and watch the shift, and we expect it actually to change uh, materially uh, every 12 months because things are just moving that quickly. So with yeah. that, I want to thank everybody for their participation and all of these fantastic questions. Um, appreciate your time today. Tomorrow, check your email, and we will send out a recording uh, to the uh, 